As the pandemic hit and the election took place, I just had this sense that something really bad was going to happen. And I, I, I sketch it all out. I go back and I, you know, interviewed a lot of the people that were with him during this period. And that's where I came to the conclusion that we were in a really dangerous spot, even more dangerous than we realized. Hey, what's going on? How are I you? Know, I know you. Jonathan Carl. Jonathan Carl. Yes. How are you? I'm very well. I see you on my TV screens. Every every once in a while. Yeah. ABC News and all of that. Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> what an honor. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on this show. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big I'm a big uh, fan of your father's. And uh, I, I think I've met you know, most, a lot of people in your family, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. So Jonathan Carl, I, what I wouldn't give to like go into your brain and see <laughs> all the things that you've seen and all the things that, you know, yeah, it, it might be frightening, but yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been a, it's been a hell of a ride. Wow. Wow. So how did you become Jonathan Carl. Uh, by that, I mean the Jonathan Carl that I see on my TV screens every night. Or not every night, but often. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I've I've always, uh, I think I've, I've always kind of knew I'd be a journalist. I don't know what I would have to do if I'd have to have to re a real job, you know. Um, you know, the idea of getting paid uh, to come to work every day to try to learn something new. Uh, I'm a big, I'm a, I've always been fascinated by history. So, you know, the, the chance to kind of be at the front lines as history is unfolding. I, I think it really started when I was in fourth grade, going into fifth grade, and I went on a family trip uh, across the country. My, um, my, my mom, my stepfather, my grandmother, we loaded into this, into this van and just drove across country. And we got to Mount Rushmore. We went to, and, and, you know, we, we see the, the big, you know, the heads on the mountain and all that. And my mom and my stepfather got fascinated by how they did it, how they actually did the artwork, how the sculpture was made. Um, and there was nothing to explain it at the mountain. It was all about the presidents. You know, this is Washington, Jefferson. This is why they were chosen, the shrine of democracy. Anyway, we like dropped everything uh, uh, the, 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 the following fall and actually moved to South Dakota and they got the University of South Dakota to give them a small stipend to go around and to try to track down and interview all of the people that worked on creating Mount Rushmore. So I missed a hell of a lot of school. I lived in a town of 350 people, actually on the outskirts of the town. It wasn't even in the middle of the town, uh, Hill City, South Dakota. And um, we, we went around and we tried to find, we, there, was, there was no Google. You couldn't like say, who are these people and what are their addresses? We, they had to like send out like notices in newspapers. If you know anybody that worked on Mount Rushmore, please have them contact us. And I sat, I, I went around as they interviewed these people and I thought, well, I guess that's kind of a cool thing to do, you know, put a tape recorder out and have people tell stories. Amazing. And that's what I did, you know? Amazing. And, and, and you just wrote a book. Yeah. Yeah, I got it actually. Uh, I just wrote I wrote this. It's called Betrayal, and it's my second book on um, on the experiences that I've had covering the White House uh, and all that led to this crazy thing that I still can't quite get my head around that we that we've experienced. But this this is really about the. Um, the last year of the Trump presidency when all hell broke loose. And I was there for all of it. And what did you learn? You know, um, what the, 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 the conclusion here is that uh, we came a lot closer to losing everything than I realized at the time. Um, and I think a lot of us realized uh, that, that it really was, uh, you know, we, we, we've had a little, we've had a, a, a democratic experiment in this country. You know, it all started in Greece, I guess, a long time ago. But, um, you know, th that one hit the rocks after a while, too. And, and uh, um, Donald Trump, uh, 
came very close to, to to basically ending the democratic experiment. The whole thing about American democracy is that we have a peaceful transition of power, that we can have deep political divisions, we can fight it out during campaigns when the campaign is over. You know, the the, the loser concedes, the winner wins, and and you wait until the next election. And, and he put all of that in doubt. Um, I mean, you know, we had a civil war in this country uh, in the uh, early 1860s, but um, <laughs> I mean, even uh, you know, even the election of 1860, 1864, uh, you know, went, went off, and um, and 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 Trump, Trump for the first time uh, tried to end that. And but but the year, you know, I, I was covering the White House when the pandemic hit, and I've got this crazy story of of seeing Trump in in March of 2020, get, getting getting called into a meeting with him in the Oval Office. Um. But as that as the pandemic hit and the and the election took place, I just had this sense that something was, you know, something really bad was going to happen. And I, I, I sketch it all out. I go back and I, you know, interviewed a lot of the people that, you know, that were were with him during this period. And and and, and that's where I came to the conclusion that, um, that 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 we were in a really dangerous spot, even more dangerous than we realized. Do you know what? I, I grew up in London and yep. I grew up in the 80s. I grew up with Reagan. I grew up with Maggie. America being like this shining uh, light on the hill, as, as, as Reagan said. You know, I grew up with the A-team. I grew up with Dallas. And, and I would always look to America as being this like bastion of hope, right, yeah. as a kid and, yeah. and, and as a young adult. And to see what happened in 2020, starting in 2016, for me, was truly soul-destroying. And I'm not exaggerating. It was truly soul-destroying to see this bright light kind of be be slowly flickering out. And then what happened in January the 6th? And, And it's like America gives hope to so many people in the world. And yet, if America implodes on itself, yeah. the end result is not going to be good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I think that was the reaction of, of a lot of people around the world. For me, my American perspective, um, you know, and 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 kind of coming of age in the shadow of those presidents and Mount Rushmore. Um, and you know aspiring i mean really from that even that young age i mean i think that dreaming of being a uh you know a, a white house correspondent you know um was something i probably thought about you know even as a even as a fifth grader uh the the, the opportunity to go we you know we as a kid i would visit washington um and i would look at the capitol building and um there's a light, you know, that you have the Capitol Dome and, and then there's the, um, uh, the, the the statue of the goddess of liberty on the top. And, and right beneath that statue on the top of the dome, there's a light that is on when Congress, either the House or the Senate is in session. And, you know, I would look to see if it was in session and then I would like bother my, you know, my, my, my mom uh, to let me go in, you know, I want to go in. Can I go in and go into the chamber and watch? watch what was going on um and i I felt awe walking into that building and seeing that building and i felt the same awe looking at the white house i couldn't go in the white house i didn't have a pass or anything i didn't know so i but i could just look at it you know through the fence um so when i you know eventually became a reporter and got a chance to cover capitol hill which i did for for many years um many years for cnn um for eight years and, and then for abc and when I became a White House uh, correspondent, no matter what I accomplished um, or how senior I became in, in the ranks, I became the president of the White House Correspondents Association. I, I, I never lost that sense of like awe of walking into the place and what it represented, and thinking, you know, Abraham Lincoln, you know, uh, worked out of this uh, out of this building, you know, the the great debates of our time took place here and, you know, Capitol Hill. Um, so I was, I had a similar reaction of just being, 
you know, I was on live television when they when they when they attacked the Capitol, and it, it was it was hard to like hold back the tears. I mean, I, I, first of all, I was reporting. I knew it was a really important story. I had to be on top of it. I was like, you know, reaching out to you know people to find out what was happening with the you know inside. What you know what 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 was you know what was behind all of this. But I was heartbroken at the same time. Absolutely heartbroken. But the point of the point of it, Leon, is as horrific as January 6th was, and to see that building come under attack by people using up flags, uh, you know, to 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 break windows, uh, flagpoles. Um, as horrific as it was, the 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 crime, the high crime, um was not just January 6th. That was in some ways the actual assault on the building itself is not the most significant event. It was, it was, it was something that began on, on, you know, for me in a way uh, there were things before, but the real big thing was uh, election night. Um, when I saw a president of the United States give the most dangerous speech a president's ever given. And it's more dangerous than the speech he gave on January 6th, by the way. But it's when he came out at 2.30 in the morning and the votes were still being counted and he declared that he had won. And he said something that really wasn't noted much. I don't think it got enough note at the time. He said that he was going to go to the Supreme Court to stop uh, uh, stop the counting of the votes, which of course he couldn't, there was no grounds to do that, but people watching that wouldn't have known, you know, I mean, millions of people, uh, there, he, he's the president and people who loved him would have believed him. People who hated him would have believed that he was going to do that. You know, he just put a, a Supreme court, third Supreme court justice. He just put on the, on the bench, like, you know, a week before think about it. Um, and I thought we would see, I mean, there was a potential right there to see violence in the streets and, and everything else. But the idea that a president, somebody that we had entrusted with, with all that responsibility, you know, I mean, anyway, I, I don't mean to get too heavy on, on your thing, but it was, uh, oh. you know, to me, that was, and, and then all that happened after and all the, the effort to use the Justice Department to pressure uh, uh, Republican officials in the states to overturn the results in their states. Fortunately, most of them said no and 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 and, and didn't do what he demanded. Um, and then in the end, to like to think that his vice president, you know, one man, one person, could single handedly turn over the election results is insane. And that's what he really turned the screws on him. And what if anyway? I mean, what would what what if Pence had done it? You know, uh, as you're sharing this, my whole body has chills. Yeah. You know, I've been I've been fortunate not to have grown up in any war zones. I've been fortunate mm -hmm. not to have grown up in any dictatorships, but I have read enough books. My grandfather fought the Nazis. I'm from England. We get stories of the Blitz. I've read enough, watch enough documentaries. I know from that perspective how catastrophic it is when you are taken over by an authoritarian regime. Yeah. Right. And to, it, 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 it boils my blood. It really boils my blood. And um, you may not actually remember this, but yeah. in 2016, yeah. you came to my brother's wedding. Yes. Yes. And we were chatting about yeah. Donald Trump. And you said to me, and I've never forgotten this. I really have never forgotten this. And I always, whenever I see you on TV, I'm like, Jonathan Carl said this to me. And it yeah. was, you said, don't worry, he's not going to win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh, okay, it's Jonathan Carl. He's not going to win. Now, everyone <laughs> said that, right? And everyone was wrong. Yeah. yeah? yeah. But I guess that yeah. leads to my question. How, how is it that so many people, tens and tens of millions of people yeah. voted for someone who so clearly has done egregious things to the brand of America being yeah. one of them. Yeah. 
I mean, look, it's a uh, it's it's a great question. It's really the question. It's really the the question. I tried to grapple with it uh, in in my first book, where I acknowledged uh, exactly you know the, the, you know the view that I had that I expressed to you, um, and and I talk a bit about how it came to happen and how it came to be in 2016. And I, and I, and what I do is I call it, it was a black swan event. It was one of these things that just, um, you, 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 you cannot anticipate the, the, the number of things that had to come together the way they came together for him to win uh, that election. It was a, it was a fluke. Uh, he of course lost the popular vote decisively, but managed to, you know, through a series of factors that included um, uh, the, the absolute incompetence of the of, of the Hillary Clinton campaign, uh, you know, events in 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 those in those key five states that nobody would have thought he would have won that that, that, that he ended up winning ever so narrowly, but enough to uh, enough to win that victory in the electoral college. Um, but put all that aside, I mean, even if it's just a he 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 got at that point i think it was 63 million or so votes and uh his his turnout in 2020 was 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 much bigger he got more votes now he also brought out <laughs> opposition in a way that no other candidates ever brought out opposition and Joe Biden, you know, um, beat him by an even more decisive uh, margin in, in, in the popular vote uh, because there were Americans were afraid and, and, and wanted anything. I think they would have voted for anybody. I mean, you know, Mickey Mouse could have run um, and, uh, and, 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 and would have, <laughs> would have won i believe i believe really just about really anybody was going was going to uh win because people but that doesn't answer the question you raised how could tens of millions of people after what they had witnessed for four years in 2016 they hadn't seen it yet um i think that uh you know he's a um uh donald trump is is a you know is a, is a, is a, is, a, is a salesman he's a con man and uh he convinces people that he is the ultimate winner you know nobody's richer nobody's more successful nobody's a greater developer nobody's had better television shows nobody has bigger crowds nobody does anything better and and there was this sense that you know he could do for the country what he had done for himself i mean look at the guy he's got these huge buildings in new york he's got a plane with his name on it you know, most politicians uh, uh, who are wealthy hide their wealth and try to pretend they're just an you know you know average Joe. I mean, Donald Trump never did that. He bragged about it, exaggerated it, way exaggerated it, um, and and portrayed himself as the guy that, that 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 would never lose, and he would bring that same ethos uh, to the White House, and a lot of people believed it, um, which is why you know. When, when you think about the series of losses that he has had, I, I'd be tempted to make a similar statement to you about him running again and ever winning again, as I made in 2016. Um, I, I, I won't, I won't do that because of how it worked <laughs> out last time. But um, when you think about the series of losses that, that, uh, that, that, that he has done, uh, he's the first president since Herbert Hoover, who was of course our, our president when the great depression hit uh, to lose the House, the Senate, and the White House, he lost again the presidency in 2020 by a you know massive margin, much bigger in the popular vote than in the electoral college. Um, he tried 60 plus different efforts to turn over the election or, or challenge parts of the election in legal cases after after uh, after people voted. He lost all of them. There was one case where they had a technical victory, but it was basically 60 plus to zero. Uh, he tried to get the House uh, to overturn to vote, the House and the Senate to overturn the election results. He lost that. He tried to get uh, Republican legislative leaders in, in Georgia and in, in, in Pennsylvania and in Michigan to vote to overturn the election. He lost that. I mean, this guy's lost a lot. But I think that the reason why it was so existential to him not to acknowledge he lost the presidency and he fought to such ridiculous lengths is because he had this feeling that he he knows that that his appeal 
that the reason why those people in the red hats love him so much, at least he believes this, is because he's a guy that never loses. And I think his fear was if they saw weakness, if they saw that he had lost, suddenly they would run for the exits. Can you imagine thinking about your supporters that way? I mean, you know, when when I think of like the people I've covered over the years, some of the very best speeches I have ever covered have been my people who lost. Some of them then came back, by the way, but some of the very best speeches. Uh, I, I covered the 2000 campaign for CNN when Al Gore also won the popular vote <laughs> and, and, and ultimately lost uh, to George W. Bush. And of course, there was the Supreme Court stopping the recount in Florida. Uh, Gore gave the very best speech of his life the day that he conceded. John McCain gave an absolutely awesome speech when he lost to Barack Obama in 2008. And when he mentioned Obama's name, the crowd started to boo. He's like, no, no, no. We're going to wish him well. He's our president now. You know, I mean, those are the moments that like make America, in my opinion. So again, (laughs) uh, I don't know if I answered your question about how, how it, how that all happened, but you know, I think that the other aspect besides being portraying himself as the man who always wins is, you know, there's a lot of the political division in our country is, is, is obvious. It's been there long before Trump and it had been growing deeper and deeper and showing a willingness to go over the top in his uh, attacks on the people that on his political opponents um, had an appeal to these people. I mean, he, he, he lock her up. I mean, can you imagine running against the, you know, somebody and you're, and you're, you're calling for her to go to jail. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really sad. And, and what, what you mentioned about McCain's speech and Al Gore's speech, to me, that's the magnificence of America. Yeah. That's the moral high ground. That's the true power of America is, mm-hmm. is, is being in that moral high ground place. There's no perfection, of course, but the moment you lose your values, the moment you lose your morality and the moral high ground, you become like everybody else, yeah. right? Doesn't matter how many weapons, how many guns you have, that moral high ground is so critical. And, and as I watch the news and as I see what's going on in America, it seems that that moral high ground that America has had for so long is being whittled away. And that to me is the biggest danger. Yeah. 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 And like you said, there's been hypocrisy. There's been, I mean, you know, and, and America's obviously been a, a you know, an imperfect uh, country. I mean, uh, Lord knows, um, you know, going back to, 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 to the fact that when the country was founded, it was, uh, it was, you know, white men who owned property. <laughs> it was a democracy. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, we had, we had nearly a century of slavery. Um, but the aspiration uh, and, you know, to, to, and the challenge to live up to the principles of, of the founding are, you know, are what, what, what made America, America. And, and, you know, that was all, it, it became, who is the most, it became a power game. You know, can I, can I steal this basically? I mean, he was trying to steal the election. So now the big question is where it goes from here. And obviously, um, you know, the, 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 the challenge is still, is still there. And what he did in 2000 was he eroded people's faith in our democratic system, which is the really the basis of it all, you need to believe that you vote, your vote counts, and therefore you honor the results when it's over. And he's caused not only people that support him to distrust the elections, the changes that he's pushing his supporters to make in the states now are also causing people on the left to distrust elections as well. And that's where it gets really dangerous. And that's where it gets to be an existential threat. If you don't have faith, if you don't believe you can trust the system, then what the hell is democracy? I mean, you know, Saddam Hussein had elections uh, all the time. You know, he won 98%. Putin's got elections. You know, it helps when you can throw your opponents in jail or poison them and ban it and ban any uh, media that would be remotely critical of you. Uh, but he has elections. 
his people count the votes, but he has elections. I mean, you, you have to be able to trust that there's there's a that that, that, that the system works. It's not just that, that there are, there's a vote. <laughs> it's got to have integrity. Every American should listen to what you just said yeah. because it's chilling. It's chilling. I, I, I give um, I give uh, speeches um, all over America and all over the world, and one of the things I tell people is I say, if we live in a world where there is no empathy. Auschwitz happens. Yeah. Right. And I share that story because we have to feel what is going on. We have to look back into history and see what actually happened and know that the delusion that this could never happen in America is now just that a delusion because it can. And it yeah. will if we yeah. don't do something about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, freedom, um, uh, democracy, these things that we, you know, these terms that we just kind of uh, th think are kind of uh, there for define who we are. I mean, they, they have to be they have to be defended and they have to be you have to fight to defend them. It's been a democratic experiment <laughs> the, the the entire thrust of world history is not this it's 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 power um and it's those with power ruling um it's it's war um i mean we we've we've lived through a period that's uh a bit of an anomaly in terms of the sweep of of, of world history and it can go back what do you think that's going to happen to this little experiment of ours that we're currently living in it's two, I think it's 246 odd years or something. Well, I, I think um, I, I, am, I am optimistic that the, that the pendulum will swing back and that people will realize what we have and realize and get, and get serious. Now, um, I think that actually what we're seeing, what, what we've seen happen in Ukraine uh, adds to that sense. Uh, that's been a very, it's been awful, obviously, uh, horrific. Um, but I think it's injected a, a degree of seriousness into our political discourse here. It's been unifying, not totally unifying, obviously. I mean, the weird thing, we, we have these, <laughs> we have people who still like, you know, seem infatuated with Putin and to admire Putin. Uh, and many of them, oddly, are people who were the most fervent supporters of Donald Trump. It's a, it's a bizarre thing. Um, but um, I think that this is wake, I think that this is a wake up call. And I, and I think that it has caused people to realize, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> things can go really bad really quickly. Things can go really bad really quickly. Yeah. It's absolutely true. And, and I brought up the Auschwitz story because I went to Auschwitz in 2012. Yeah. I've been fascinated and read a lot about the Holocaust. And I went to Auschwitz and it changed me. It yeah. truly changed me. It's like, how can human beings behave like this. Mm. And, I, and I heard a quote from Voltaire. And the quote, I may butcher it, but the quote said, if you can make people believe absurdities, you can make people commit atrocities. Yeah. And yeah. that sent chills through me. Yeah, like my God. Yeah. When, when, what time of year did you go to Auschwitz, by the way? It was in the summer. I went there for the, um, I think it was the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the, of the, of the, of the death camps and um, Auschwitz and Birkenau and, and, and to, uh, and it was in the middle of the, it was the middle of the winter and it was so bitterly chillingly cold. And it just, it just somehow brought the horror. I mean, you see all the, it changed me too. And you think that, um, you know, those people were all brought in like, like cattle. And um, in addition to all the other horrors they had to endure, it was freaking like intolerably cold. <laughs> you know, I mean, they had nothing to, uh, it's just, and, and, and the idea that, that human beings could treat other human beings that way. And it's not just one guy. I mean, there's a system that, 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 that existed that required 
lots of people to do a lot of things. And, and so you got it at with, with the question of, you know, how did so many people support what happened here in the United States? You think of it in terms of watching uh, Putin, who's been basically in power for 22 years. Um, and, you know, it's done all he does to kind of eliminate his opposition and control the flow of information. Yeah, you know, but it's ultimately even now, by all accounts, a pretty popular figure in Russia. You know, he can't exist without support, even, you know, it's deeply disturbing because, again, it's not it's not one guy. And I think that goes back to empathy. Yeah, if you have no empathy as one person, as millions of people. Then you can do things that someone with some empathy will not do. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is. When you feel someone's pain, when you feel your own pain, when you are, I think what Putin is doing by saying he's denazifying Ukraine is he is dehumanizing the Ukrainians so yes. that the Russian people are okay with their, their Ukrainian brothers being bombed and slaughtered. Yep. It's a simple thing that's been done for centuries, the dehumanization of your enemy, Rwanda, yep. the Jews in the Second World War, Ukraine now. And it all stems from, from one person's complete lack of empathy and using the system that you mentioned to put that into the, the veins of the citizenry, right? Yep. And yep. It fills my blood with, with, with rage, but we're not going to go there. Um, it's just, it's just really painful to see. It really is. It's really painful to see. How do you think this is all going to end? Well, you know, I I think that we're going to have in the United States a um, deeply consequential uh, election in 2024. I think that the odds are that actually it ends up being neither Biden nor Trump running, um, which would be a chance to, to turn the page and want to eliminate the, uh, 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 the, you know, the fundamental challenges. I think that you're going to have a very good sense of where it goes in the United States sooner than that. Over the next three months, there, there are going to be a series of primaries um, in the U.S., Republican primaries where Donald Trump has taken a position and he's supported, you know, really fringe people who believe exactly what he believes, the, um, the, 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 the absurdities, who believe those absurdities. Um, and I think he's going to lose uh, several of these races. So I'll give you one to watch. And there are several. Um, but in Georgia, uh, he is on a all out jihad against uh, uh, the Republican governor, Brian Kemp, who refused his demands to convene a special session after the election to overturn the results in, in, in Georgia. Uh, so he supported this guy, David Perdue, former senator, uh, to uh, to challenge him in the Republican primary. Um, if Kemp wins that after after Trump has basically made Kemp like his almost, you know, not quite number one tar target, but certainly top top two or three, that'll be an indication that, you know, that the emperor has no clothes. And also in that same election, Brad Raffensperger, the, uh, the, the secretary of state of Georgia, who bravely stood up to Trump, another Republican, um, you know, the famous phone call on January 2nd, where Trump was asking him to find 11,000, you know, plus votes to turn up, you know, he's, Trump's trying to beat him, has recruited a member of Congress to run against him. I mean, if Brad Raffensperger wins, if those two guys win, you know, I, 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 it should be a message to Republicans everywhere that maybe we are we shouldn't be so afraid of challenging this guy. If those two can win, I'll give you another one, just one more. Uh, Lisa Murkowski is the senator from Alaska. She was the uh, she's the only senator who voted to convict Donald Trump, Republican. In, in, in the impeachment trial, voted to convict and remove from office. Obviously, he had actually already left, but, you know, but 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 voted guilty. Uh, in the impeachment trial, who is up for reelection? And I, I think she's almost almost certainly going to win. 
again, should be a message. Don't be afraid to challenge this guy. These Republicans did, and they survived. Don't be afraid to challenge wrong. Yeah. With every fiber of goodness in your soul. Yeah. And don't be afraid to stand up for truth. <laughs> Yes. You know, I mean, the, the, that Voltaire quote, I'm going to have to, you know, uh, uh, absurdities into atrocities. I mean, the absurdities that they're still saying. I mean, you believe some of this stuff? I mean, I get into it. But, uh, you know, the, the voting machines were rigged. The Italian spy satellites switched votes. Uh, the Chinese made wireless thermostats. Nest, you know, Nest, Nest thermostats, the wireless. Yeah. Those were used to switch votes in Georgia. That uh, the, the, the servers uh, uh, from a Spanish company, the servers in Germany were used to change votes in Antrim County, Michigan. The search for Chinese bamboo in the uh, ballots in Arizona uh, because, you know, the Chinese shipped ballots in to be. I mean, this stuff is freaking bonkers, man. It's like you, you can't, you know, I mean, really? <laughs> Are people that actually believe this. Yeah. One of them lives in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't know if he, he probably doesn't believe it, but he's, 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 he's touting it because it can fool people into thinking that he actually won and he's gotten people to believe it. You know, Jonathan, there are few good and wise men, mm -hmm. but you are one of them. I'm serious. I do not say oh. that lightly. I remember our meeting in 2016 I felt your soul. I felt your heart. I felt your presence. And you are a good, wise man. Keep doing what you're doing and keep enlightening people to stop believing the absurdities. Well, Leon, thank you. And thank you for, for doing all that you do and for the belief that you have in, 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 the, in, in the goodness of, of human beings and, and, and bringing that out through your adventures and sharing your adventures uh, with, with everyone else. I, I, this, this was really fun. Thank you for... Uh, I mean, I was going to say thank you for having me, but you didn't even know you were having me. I mean, that's kind of, you know. <laughs> I did not know. I did not know, but I'm glad that they made it happen. And, uh, thank you for not turning off the computer when you saw it was me, you know. So yeah, uh, it was yeah. good. It was good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, I hope to see you again in person sometime soon. A hundred percent. Thanks so much, man. All right. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have